least 10 years back, we taught a course between the Seattle and Lahore. So it was a <coughs> ICTD course, one of the early offerings of ICTD. It was a live distance learning course, um, which now we would just use Skype, but a decade ago with homegrown technology, research assistants would make sure all of the network were up and spend a few hours having everything prepared so that the two of us could go live. And the most amazing thing is getting over a 12-hour timeline. And the fact that Umar was able to teach at 6 a.m. from Lahore, and students were present at 6 a.m. from Lahore. So he's always been, you're just amazed at dedication to be able to contribute to that type of partnership at that hour of the morning. I, I was going to say that the most challenging aspect of that course was the 6 a.m. class. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, we, we, we got about 50 odd students at Lamps when we signed up for the course. And, uh, and, and the strength of the students actually continued to improve as the course went along. And uh, I think there's still a YouTube video as, as evidence that that course happened and, and the excitement was generated. I would largely come here to say thank you to everyone who's traveled down to Pakistan to participate, certainly in the DFS workshop with all sides. It took us many years to get here. We started with small workshops. I remember you know, trying to invite many of you in previous years. Finally, we've succeeded. And I will be also hosting this big ICT work, uh, conference in Pakistan. This also happens to be Pakistan's our first major computer science conference. And I'm glad that you know, many years of collaboration and friendship has finally culminated into bringing computer science home uh, to Pakistan. So I want to thank you specifically for this. I know your better halves or, or, or lesser halves would have advised you against coming to Pakistan. <laughs> so this must have taken a uh, you know, considerable degree of bravery to travel down to Pakistan and sign up for something like this. But Pakistan is a better place because you came here, because ICT is happening here, and, and this country will be thankful to you uh, in years to come as, as this country continues to improve and 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 the presence becomes more mainstream in Pakistan. I also want to thank folks from Kalandar, they must be somewhere around here, uh, folks from the industry and my professors and students who all participated in this. Now that was essentially what I I wanted to say, but then Kentaro made this was was finishing up his talk and said things that got me thinking. So I want to say a little bit about that with Kentaro's permission. Uh, and, and Kentaro's thesis I think is is important because it makes you think both ways. Uh, the, the thesis is that technology amplifies good and bad both, and in fact, it actually could make things worse uh, in countries that have social uh, fissures or political polarization or social inequality. That may be true, but I, I, I sat there and Pinaro and, and got me thinking in, in when we can able to put technology to use to rename, fix. Uh, uh, or, or minimize the impact of negative forces in the society. And we've done that many times over. And so let's start out by use of technology in the world's largest cash, cash transfer program. So Pakistan actually runs the world's largest cash transfer program called the Energy in Income Support Program, paid out to about 2.1 million people every month. And technology actually plays a big role in making sure that that cash reaches uh, the, 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 the deserving cash recipients. B without the use of technology to do geomapping, registration, verification of the credentials, house to house, poverty survey, and then use of uh, either ATM cards or mobile wallets to do the transfer of the money, the, all this money would have been lost to political patronage, uh, to inefficiencies in the intermediaries, and so on and so forth. That, that would have really worked out uh, because uh, we could put technology to good use. And we actually built on top of that in the province and introduced two additional programs. One is a health insurance program, and that's not universal health coverage, this is a health insurance program for, uh, for the bottom of the pyramid. So we could really target our subsidy to people in the to bottom of the pyramid and give health insurance because we had that data, could do that analysis and do sort of very targeted subsidies in that case. Same is true for what we call the female stipend program where for, for school going uh, females at grade five who typically would drop off uh, going into middle school at grade six, 
uh, we pay, now pay their families a uh, thousand rupees per month as as a cash subsidy, an targeted cash subsidy, actually transferred out to their mobile wallets, uh, uh, and and then tied to attendance, actually IRS based attendance of the female schools in the school. So there's a school and the parents can't collude to keep these girls out, but still cash out. Actually, significant amount of technology at play to pay out about 4.5 billion rupees every month as a cash transfer stipend uh, to female students in South of Punjab so that they can continue to come to school at grade six and onwards. In fact, just about every technology that the Punjab IT board has developed in the last six years that I've been away from mainstream academia has actually been fighting with those negative forces. So whether this is um, the, the revenue officers refusing to give you the ownership document of your land called the FERT, which is not in the interest of the entire system, because the entire system sort of is based on this extortion where they demand money bribes in return for giving you uh, a, an ownership document of the land that you actually own, we've been able to put together a system that has almost eliminated that. Where police stations were denying you uh, a, a, the right to register a police complaint without receiving a bribe, that has almost been eliminated. Uh, where uh, vaccinators were refusing to go to households and, and places and neighborhoods to vaccinate children which were inconvenient for them. They would only go to places that were close to their house and, and instead would, would pocket the fuel allowance that they were given or the, or, and were selling our vaccination in the market without going out and vaccinating the children. And we were to almost eliminate that using smartphone applications, you know, machine learning, tracking, etc. From about 18% coverage in Punjab to 93% coverage in a year and a half, almost a sea change in just the way we vaccinate children, and so on and so forth. All of these are examples where technology has actually fought with a social fissure, with, with economic, dis, uh, uh, economic disparity, with social, uh, with, 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 with political uh, polarization, and has been able to minimize it repeatedly. And, and almost every time I go in and, and want to do an intervention in the government, uh, this is an adversarial intervention to the status quo. No one really wants it. It affects the livelihood of lots of people. It impacts politics. It impacts patronage. It impacts the social society in very profound, interesting ways. And at times, this totally changes the political economy of that little vertical. So I just wanted to highlight those examples also, while totally acknowledging what you just said. And social media is certainly a great example for that, where I don't think the society was as politically polarized as it, as it is today. Uh, without Twitter and social media. In fact, you know, what happens in social media and we have this running joke, at times is in a totally different status of here compared to what is actually going on in the country, but it's hugely polarized. And, and at times it actually drives opinion on mainstream media also. Uh, so these polarizations actually sort of, you know, spill over into just the national narrative. And at times that, you know, that could be quite negative and quite bitter. Uh, and, and, and so that I think is spot on. Uh, we, we're still looking at uh, ways to do sort of an electronic election at some stage in Pakistan, some biometrically verified electronic voting mechanism. Uh, and, and for me, the jury is still out on whether that will help or, or actually impede uh, the democratic transition. But that's something that people like me worry about. Uh, there are good documents on both sides. But that's sort of, again, one technology, I think, uh, that once put into place could potentially stitch up the so social fissures. But you know, may work the other way around also. But I don't know. But that's a one big experiment that I'm waiting to see whether I'll be involved in that experiment or we'll have a gallery suite with popcorns to see how that unfolds. But I think that's another one that universally, globally, we need to study and understand and how that has either made the, the democratic governments uh, you know, more stable, more legitimized, or, or it worked otherwise. And I think it sort of it, it actually worked both ways. But that, I think, needs to be looked at more closely also. The kind of stuff that Curtis does, given that he's always here, so I need to do a shout out for his work also, is also an example of how technology is able to actually, I think, connect and empower uh, people who otherwise are disconnected in terms of reduced communication with the society. So I think all the work that, uh, that, uh, that Curtis has done is also exciting and, and needs to be looked at very carefully, where at least islands of connectivity are enabled in countries like Pakistan, Indonesia, etc., and how that helps with 
with social equality or at least mobility, economic mobility, et cetera, et cetera. That I think is, is an interesting case to be also. And then finally all this financial, financial inclusion work. The government shortly, shortly is maybe a month from now, is going to move its 300 billion rupee collection, taxes, levies, fees to electronic payments. Uh, took me a two year battle with the, with the state bank and the national bank to convince them that they should allow us to do that. Uh, in this time, I've done most of my disbursements using mobile wallets and electronic payments, but never collections. One, they were limited to the national uh, state bank, uh, and, and now we've convinced them that they should allow private banks to do it. And, and we finally now made all the processes and payment mechanisms such that we can collect money electronically. Now, once, as soon as I take that step, because that's big enough that most of the mobile wallets have become real. At this point, the adoption is, is, is questionable. But once you can pay your traffic tickets using mobile payments, once you can pay your property taxes using mobile payments, once you can buy and sell your vehicles using mobile payments, this would become real. And then people will add more merchants to it, private merchants, etc. But that, is, I think, is also a step in a direction uh, which will, I hope, lead to some financial inclusion. I'm not sure, but I'm hoping that that will lead to some financial inclusion. And that is an experiment that we need to also closely study and understand in terms of how technology might bring some social equality in the society, make people some more first grade bank bankable citizens. And by that might lead to some interesting observations. So I just wanted to put that on the table for your next book as for mm -hmm. <laughs> for your next book and, and, and for all the work that this community does. I want to again thank you for making the effort uh, to come down to Pakistan. To our, our, our local folks here, you, I, as a professor, you don't realize how big a deal it is to get these people to come to Pakistan. Uh, they're really, really accomplished, distinguished people. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and I'm actually very happy and very proud uh, that because of this big conference that's happening in a couple of days, uh, folks like Richard, Kentaro, Curtis, Je Jennifer, and, and others, and there's a whole boat full of them arriving tomorrow, uh, are, are traveling down to Pakistan for ICGD. Uh, and, and, and very happy and proud for all the work, all the work that the university is doing to be able to accomplish this. Uh, thank you again for coming down here. I hope it was successful useful conference for you. It all, all continues tomorrow also. There are a bunch of talks about industry linear linkages. Most of that largely is fluff. Uh, but, uh, but in this case, I think I'm, I'm beginning to like comments uh, that, that are very real, very tangible, especially comments about how uh, grants to be given out to academics, or money to be given out to academics, how this goes needs to go beyond these workshops, uh, and, and how we need to actually cobble together these relationships. Someone who's a vice chancellor of the university, works for the government, has worked in the industry for a long time. I can tell you it's not as straightforward as, as it, is, it, is, it is made to, made to be. It requires more profound, deeper analysis on how something like this can be manufactured. Otherwise, good about 273 billion rupees going to the Higher Education Commission every year, you know, trying to accomplish some of this, and I've seen that happen for a reason. That hasn't happened. So we need to learn from the NSFs and the dark bars and the UNRs and the, and the MacArthur Fellowships and so on and so forth. How some of that is cobbled together and put together in countries like the US where industry actually benefits from the academia and vice versa. But I hope this leads to some of those discussions and that Pakistan learns new things from this. Okay, thank you so much. Everybody.